Hello and welcome to Books at HSS, a podcast by the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at LUMS in collaboration with Radio LUMS. For this podcast, we invite faculty at the HSS Department at LUMS to talk about their books. And for our inaugural episode today, we have with us Dr. Maryam Wasif Khan, who is an Associate Professor of Comparative Literature and Cultural Studies at LUMS. And we will be discussing her book, Who is a Muslim? Orientalism and Literary Populisms, published by Fordham University Press in 2021. Welcome, Mariam, and thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Fezi. So before we dive into the book, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your intellectual journey leading up to this project? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, so I think that this you know, let me just say first off, I am a fiction reader. I work on fiction, uh, and and really at the heart, that's something that's at the heart of this book. Um, but you know, very on on a more on on a stricter note, um, my work with some of two of the texts that are central to this book started in the second year in my second year of graduate school way back in two thousand and nine, um, and you know, some ten years, twelve years later, I have this this book in my hand that that really. Uh, you know, really begins, as I said, when I was a very uh, young and naive uh, <laughs> a graduate student. But, um, you know, there are there are kind of larger influences on the on the uh, way that this book is thought out on the kinds of journeys that this book is trying to trace. And of course, those uh, really, I, I have to say, um, central to those are my uh, graduate advisor, Amir Mufti, who, uh, who, who, who is a student, was a student of Edward Said's way mm-hmm. back in the um, 1990s. And the the coming together of Amir's reading of Said's work mm. as well as my own reading of Said's work and my own uh, propensity towards thinking about um, um, fiction in a, in a very historical fashion um, is is you know what makes this allows this book to become um, uh, what it is. Uh, so so much of the work uh, that I did do for this book I did in in, in graduate school, um, and there is a final chapter uh, to mm. the way that this book takes you know this this final shape and and that comes from uh being back in Pakistan um at a time when you know Pakistani society were in we're in what I call a post 9/11 Pakistani uh, society um uh, the way people think about the West has suddenly mm. changed uh, there is a deep reflection of that in a new literature that's born post 9/11 um and 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 a new kind of an imaginary of of what the Muslim citizen um, is and should be uh, begins coming out in a lot of the works that I discuss in the last part of the of, of the book. And and really being in Pakistan allowed me to kind of think back all the way to this same geographical area somewhere back in the year 1800 um, and, and really connect all the dots to think about the kind of journey that um, Urdu fiction uh, took over some uh, 300 years really uh, of, 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 uh, of being. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. So let's, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, one of the central ways in which you situate Urdu literature for us is through the notion of the oriental tale and its role in constructing what you call the chronotope of the Muhammadan. So could you could you tell our tell us tell our audience what is the Oriental tale and what's the chronotope of the Muhammadan that that sort of gives us a an entry point into Urdu literature. Okay, yeah. So thanks. These are two terms that are uh, critical to to the book, uh, and they they really form my arg- help me form my argument for the next uh, five chapters. Um, the Oriental tale was a was a genre of fiction and and a kind of a, a cheap genre, a popular genre of fiction in eighteenth century, uh, uh, in eighteenth century Britain. Um, and and the genre basically was you know it consisted of small stories, um, sometimes with a moral, sometimes not. Uh, that basically channeled the West's, the the European world, and particularly the British's, the British uh, fascination uh, with the space we call the Orient. And the mm. Orient, of course, is an imaginary category. Um, but you know, actual parts of the Orient today, of course, include Egypt, include uh, the the Middle East, include South Asia, um, include China as well. So it was a vast geography um, that that was being viewed through the eyes of of this tiny island uh, in in. in in the, in the North Atlantic, um, and 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 stories being written about you know the people who who uh, 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 who who lived in in these in these spaces, um, and of course uh, a new and, and these stories pre- help produce a kind of a an imagined reality of of this of this space in um in the in the British imagination at the time. Mm. Um, so the Oriental tale. 
uh, uh, really most often focused on the figure of of what was then known as the Mohammedan. Um, and that was, uh, again, uh, 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 an, an approximate name for Muslims um, because of, because there was no there was no uh, compulsion to actually call Muslims by the names that they called themselves. So mm. Mohammedan became this uh, 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 kind of, you know, uh, crude, crude uh, naming, uh, crude category through which Muslims were named and talked about. Um, and, and, and Mohammedans were usually the heroes or, or the protagonists of these oriental tales. Tales. Um, as I detail in the book, most of the time these people were uh, barbarous sultans or traveling merchants, and and the stories really revolved around their uh, their adventures to 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 some extent. Um, of course, the stories also focused on the ostentatious nature of the sultans' lives. The you know these these licentious details about sexuality. In the case of merchants, they focused, of course, uh, inordinately on the question of travel, mm. on the question of the of of, uh, the, so the, the protagonist of the Oriental tale was really never at home because the Sultan was always um, portrayed as this barbarous figure who was the false ruler or a non-citizen ruler of, of a certain group of people. And the merchant, of course, was traveling anywhere from Damascus to Baghdad to Delhi. Um, and, and that's really the vast geography, the seamless geography that seems to, uh, uh, you know, just kind of come together in the Oriental tale with no no kind of uh, uh, compulsion to reality, no uh, no rules. Um, and, and so in a sense, the way that the West begins to imagine the Muslim world is through very much through this genre. Um, let me say one more thing about it, and then I want to turn to this question of the chronotopic, which which is an important term here. Um, the, the Oriental tale becomes very uh, becomes, in fact, one of the most ubiquitous genres in in um, 18th century uh, England and and London in particular. Um, after the publication of the Arabian Nights entertainments in um, in, Fr- in 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 France in 17 in around 1703. Um, the French edition is very quickly translated into English by around 1704, 1705. And it becomes, it's really the equivalent of, of Harry Potter or, <laughs> or something like that. And it became all the rage. Um, and, 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 and all kinds of derivations then followed from, um, um, from this genre. So for around 20 or so years, the Oriental tale was all over um, um, uh, France and, and, and England in particular and, and shaping, of course, critical to the shaping of what was a nascent colonial enterprise um, towards the East at that time. Um, now, the, the, the second uh, term, Fezi, that you raised, uh, which is which is the, the, the term I use, Mohammedan uh, chronotope, is, yeah. is an important one. I, I, I take the term chronotope from the uh, Russian uh, uh, theorist and, hist- and literary historian Mikhail Bakhtin, um, who, who thought about the chronotope as a, as, a, as a means through which fiction elaborates its, its, its own sense of time and space. So all literary works, uh, Bakhtin argued, especially the novel, that was one of his favorite genres. Um, exists within a time and space, and and it defines that 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 kind of time and space. Um, I actually kind of you know uh, 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 cheat a little bit with that, and I kind of think about what a Mohammedan chronotope looks like, and and what happens in the Oriental tale. It becomes very clear um, is that the Mohammedan chronotope. Uh, shows that the protagonist of these stories of these oriental tales that I was just talking about um, occupies a false time um, in the sense that uh, the, the Muslims are not national or are not a people of origin to any geography yeah. and that their geography is, uh, is is a false one because that is a geography that they have in some sense uh, captured. So, so the time and space of Muslims in other sense through this very Western genre is both something is, is something that is essentially uh, is, is is something that th- that they've borrowed or something that has been taken by unfair means. So so Muslims, unlike and and this is an important example, unlike the way in which Hindus are constructed um, in in different Orientalist uh, and, and sometimes even in these Oriental tales, Hindus are constructed as the natives of the Indian geography. Mm. Uh, Muslims are constructed as the conquerors uh, mm. of this geography. Um, Arabs are constructed as the rightful people of a territory that the Oriental tale calls Arabia. 
um, whereas Muslims are seen as a false layer atop this society um, and, and a kind of a revolution almost that a certain group of Arab people have taken against uh, themselves. So in a sense, uh, 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 what you see is, is, is really that, that you know, the, 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 they are formed against the idea, the Muslim figure or the Muhammadan in, in these stories is formed against the idea of indigeneity. Um, and, and, you know, in, in today's, in our present time and moment, this is an important crisis that we can see really in, in India in particular, where Muslims continue to be shown as non-indigenous, mm. as somehow non-Indian. And, and of course, this book, one of the things this book traces, of course, is this crisis and how uh, one of the, the historical moments that becomes prominent in this book, of course, is, is partition itself as well and the creation of the Pakistani state in the name of Muslims' non-indigeneity to India. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, I mean, my next question is how the Oriental tale and the way the Mohammedan is constructed in this tale uh, becomes important for the emergence and shaping of Urdu in colonial India. And that's you know, in the second chapter of your book where you have uh, the Fort William College, if you could tell us about that. And uh, folks over there who are, who are if, if, I, if I recall correctly, you talk about who are involved in the production and invention, in a sense, of Urdu. Okay, cool. So, so, so let me, um, let me, let me actually, uh, uh, you know, kind of say that, you know, of course, this the Oriental tale. If it stayed in Britain, no big deal. You know, <laughs> people can say bad things about other people. <laughs> um, but what happens is that around eighteen hundred, uh, uh, it becomes very clear that the British have a real stake in uh, developing their empire um, in India, um, and and uh, Warren Hastings becomes uh, the, fir uh, the the first Governor General of. Um, of this new of this new colony uh, that is being formed in in at that time Bengal province. Um, Warren Hastings has a sense that you know the the British uh, or the administrators uh, in in uh, in in the province need to learn the language of the natives to rule effectively, mm. and that gives way to a series uh, to a lot of money actually and and to a series of scholars who are sent to uh, scholars and sometimes uh, opportunists that are sent to India or that happen who happen to have come to India, um, and who begin developing language uh, and and the idea of literature in a very Western and very British uh, European sense of, of both terms. Um, the first figure in this in this extended story is, is a gentleman by the name of William Jones. He's a well-known Orientalist. Uh, he is known as the founder of Indo-European linguistics in, in the North American and the Euro-American uh, Euro Academy today. Um, but, but William Jones is important because he uh, is, is also a figure who is, is, is obsessed with um, origins, who's obsessed with categorization of people. And over the over over his early in his early years in um, in 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 Bengal, he founds a journal uh, and a society known as the Asiatic Researches, whose entire work, entire aim is to research um, the people that uh, the British have suddenly decided they are uh, ruling over. <laughs> Um, within Asiatic researches, uh, you know, William Jones begins coming up with theories of language, uh, um, including that, you know, one that, that that kind of designates languages as belonging to uh, a separate people. So he decides that, uh, you know, Hindi or, or, or Sanskrit, rather, at this moment, he's more interested in Sanskrit, um, belongs to the Hindus, it is the language that they they have inherited, uh, uh, or the modern Hindu, or the or the or, or that time the Hindu of, of that moment has inherited uh, from his ancestors in India. Um, Arabic is and Persian are the languages of Muslims. This is, by the way, of course, not true because the India, uh, you know, the, the India that they found was actually a cosmopolitan um, and and a, a kind of a place with many dialects that ranged whose whose designations were never national but rather were class based. Um, were job based, were gender based, even. Um, so, so you know, so so it's a whole. It's it, the, what 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 somebody like Jones begins to do is to is to recategorize Indian society um, in terms of. Um, in terms of religion in particular mm. and in terms of his idea of how and where people belong. So Arabs must speak Arabic. Mm. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Hindus that he encounters in India must speak uh, a derivative of Sanskrit. Uh, Muslims uh, in India probably must speak Persian. Um, and, and that's the way that he begins to categorize and, and see these um, 
see these languages. But his main interest at this moment, at least, uh, to be fair to him, remains in the idea of Sanskrit. Um, it's within another another uh, uh, a decade or so after Jones that uh, 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 really an opportunist, there's no other word for this man, by the name of John Gilchrist, um, who begins who decides that, look, forget the ancient languages, let's create a common dialect through which the British can really rule in India. And Gilchrist uh, decides that there is a language called Hindustani um, that he must now popularize in, in some sense or the other. Hindustani at that time was a, a, a really colloquial, uh, uh, or what he called Hindustani was the colloquial common way of speaking. It was probably approximate to the Urdu Hindi that was spoken, um, I want to say three or four decades from today, prior to the Sanskritization of, of uh, Hindi in India, uh, as following the Modi years, and uh, of course, prior to the Arabization of Urdu in Pakistan in the last uh, a couple of decades or so. But of course, it, 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 was, it, it, it was not exactly these either. Um, Gilchrist decided that if once they make a, a language that is spoken by everybody, uh, ruling over India uh, will be will be much easier. Um, the problem that Gilchrist and, and Gilchrist then goes on to uh, this is a longish story, uh, so so do bear with no, me. Please, please. Um, Gilchrist uh, is able to through his various efforts and his deep interest in in language and and you know his public earlier publications of dictionaries and travel guides and phrase books um, is able to siphon in enough funds from the new Governor General Lord Wellesley um, to create a school that goes by the name of Fort William College, in which he hires. Um, a series of uh, 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 munshis, so these local, uh, uh, local, uh, uh, you know, people who worked in courts. Really, this was a this was a category, an elite category. Really, these were educated men who were coming from the courts of various nawabs. Um, one of whom I follow quite closely in in the book, uh, Miraman. Um, and he hires these people along with uh, British scholars in local languages. So there was a professor of Bengali, there's a professor of Marathi, there's a professor of Sanskrit. And Gilchrist himself, um, uh, along with a couple of others, becomes the uh, main uh, teacher behind this language that he calls um, um, Hindustani. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Hindustani really is is you know he 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 decides gilchrist describes hindustani as uh you know as a language in which of that, that as a base as a kind of a base indian language in which um persian and arabic have uh you know, have become the main influences and so eventually and then i'm cutting a long story short here Gilchrist begins interchanging the, the term Hindustani with the term Urdu. And this is where the problem really begins. Uh, uh, but, but you know, in this moment, what Gilchrist also begins doing is, is to, uh, you know, at Fort William is to begin training young officers in, um, in, this, in this language Hindustani. Um, he begins asking uh, the Munshis who work at Fort William College to produce, um, um, to produce uh, 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 you know, stories, short stories, uh, that can be that can serve as the literature of the new language, and uh, and and this is this is where I argue this book argues the story of modern Urdu uh, really begins um, mm -hmm. in 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 India at least. So um, so 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 so. So, so, so Gilchrist in particular works with one Munshi by the name of Mir Aman, and Mir Aman is asked to begin writing, uh, uh, writing, uh, you know, and translating stories into into Hindustani, which is as as I as I said, a kind of, it's a common dialect. It's it's a spoken, it's it's a very spoken common dialect uh, at the time. Um, the the catch here is that these stories have to have a moral uh, uh, ending, and the you know the, the reason that was really was because. At that time, the politics of the moment demanded uh, uh, that there be, you know, the officers were required to have a, you know, kind of certain moral education as well. There was a fear of miscegenation, a fear that these young men sitting in India would begin visiting local prostitutes, um, would begin, uh, you know, hanging out, becoming a little too close to to Indian people, and so a lot of the morality focused on, um, you know, on on women. Uh, it but it also focused on. Uh, you know, on on what kind of a Muslim uh, was ideal, and so very slowly we begin seeing a shaping of Muslim identity in in these Hindustani stories. Now, um, one of the other things that becomes important about Hindustani is that it begins it begins 
to reflect only a Muslim identity. So mm-hmm. Gilchrist decides that because Hindustani has Persian and Arabic influences, this is a Muslim language. Um, within a few years, a separate Hindi department also begins at Fort William. And, and that's really what begins, you know, the two language divide very early on. We big like to think of this, I think, common um, in, in Park studies as when I was a student, at least in O-levels way back. I remember our Park studies uh, curriculum um, used to, you know, call the two language theory somewhere in the 1880s. But but actually, this begins very early in the 1810s or so. Um, so so this is Fort William College, this this place full of young English officers, which has a publishing department, a language teaching department. Um, and again, one could argue that, OK, what difference does this make to the uh, to the larger uh, to the larger uh, uh, um you know, culture of India to the larger world of 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 uh, Urdu literariness. Um, but but something very important happens. Um, me uh, uh, Gilchrist uh, Gilchrist uh, uh, patronizes one Munshi in particular, Miraman. Miraman writes a very important text called Bago Bahar, uh, or or also known as Kisai Char Darvesh, which is um, which he argues he has translated or has come up uh, uh, is, is is an is, is an older text written by Amir Khosrow. This is all shown to be false, and I look at that um, I look at that that historiography in the book. But what this story really is is the story of of four. Or wandering uh, uh, emergence. Much of it actually seems borrowed from the English, um, from from Oriental tales in um, in in the in the the English Oriental tale, and it um, we can see influences of the English version of the Arabian Nights in this book as well. And and again, it's it's uh, you know there's 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 many things that one can one can discuss about the book. But Bahu Bahar becomes a blockbuster of sorts. Um, um, it's it's seen as the ideal mm. book um, of uh, uh, in Hindustani. It has the right morality. It has um, the right kind of language. Everything is going for it, and um, it's declared to be. Sim- but but here's where the, where the catch. And sorry, there's there's a lot of kind of nuances mm-hmm. to this. Uh, uh, the catch is that Mir Aman actually speaks of himself as having written the book in Urdu, um, and and he uses the term Urdu repeatedly. Um, and 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 this is because Mir Aman is an elite Delhi uh, 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 artist, a writer, and he. He is he is wedded to the language of Urdu uh, uh, that 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 was of course central to Delhi life at the at the time to elite Delhi life, um, and of course Delhi and Lucknow were the two big centers of of the Urdu language, um, and and Miraman kind of goes on and on about how this book is is really uh, in some sense encompasses uh, the Urdu of Delhi. Um, and and once the book gets out of Fort William College, which it does in several ways, and and I think I'll be I'll be talking about that a little bit, uh, in 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 just a moment. Mm. But it it also reaches other uh, other other rival uh, rival mun- not munchies, but also rival artists who are outside of the British ambit, and. And and it becomes in in some ways because Mir Aman calls it Urdu, it becomes enshrined in the in the Lucknow Delhi battle as a sample of Urdu. Now this all of this is away from the British colony, and yet this this whole incident begins to affect the way in which Urdu uh, uh, aesthetes and Urdu poets, Urdu writers, um, uh, at the moment begin to see themselves. Uh, again, and and here's a, a, another explanation here. Urdu, the term Urdu at that moment did not mean the same, was not a colloquial term. It was not a spoken language. It was, in fact, um, the language of elite courts. It was the language of poets. Um, and and in, in making it the language of a common prose tale, Miraman did it a disservice. He essentially lowered the register uh, and, and conflated Urdu with this colloquial spoken Hindustani. And that's where the crisis, uh, as, and that's where modern Hindu, Hin- Urdu itself begins to, to, to take shape. Um, you know, if and, and, and I'm sure the story is getting a little bit confusing mm-hmm. right now, but but do bear with me. Um, so so all of this is going on in Fort William. Um, you know, Bako Bahar, uh, uh, also known as Kisai Char Darvesh, is circulating uh, within these Urdu aesthetic circles. Um, and again, you know, one could argue that the battle or that this whole crisis of uh, language story writing would end here, but it doesn't, um, because within another three decades, Fort Williams curriculum actually becomes the curriculum of uh, a new 
network of schools that are started by um, uh, the the British uh, in in North India in particular, and these schools, of course, become an entry point for uh, uh, for Indians who begin wanting to work in um, in in with the British. And and so what you have is now the creation of a new generation that begins to see uh, and imagine Urdu differently from. Uh, what its its earlier or its 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 parents or grandparents had known, um, it's a generation that begins to disavow Persian for again this common colloquial uh, spoken simplified Hindustani, um, and it's a generation that you know begins to also um, you know again disavow in particular from genres like the Dastan, um, which were you know ostensibly amoral uh, had geographies that were vast but that did not require you to be citizen that did not require you to have nationality um and uh, they begin to disavow from genres like the ghazal uh, uh which of course bothered the the british uh, immensely because of its abstraction so in a sense in a sense what fort william uh, sets into motion is the um you know is is the is the is the is the creation of a of a new uh, a, a, of a new aesthetic uh, imaginary mm. in um um in north india in particular and that aesthetic imaginary is really shaped in entirely uh, a, a western or, or european terms in particular uh, the term literature uh, is 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 become central to to the production of fort william and and again literature is a very different category from the word adab that is used today uh, to to uh, describe literature adab at that moment in the moment that the term literature was thrown into the indian colony was a much grander term that mm. suggested a uh, person's not just their 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 reading but also their appreciation of music, their knowledge of dance, um, their own etiquette in a gathering, um, their knowledge of languages, uh, their ability to speak in a particular fashion. So other was a way of being. It was really not the narrow restrictive category of literature um, that the British then introduced uh, upon a textuality uh, uh, in the colony at that moment. I hope this answers uh, uh, some of your questions, Fezi, because I know that that it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a kind of a longish no, no, moment, uh, and lots of things no. happen in these two decades. Right, and so so the way. Uh the Muhammad and the figure of the Muslim is constructed in, uh, in in prose works that are coming out of Fort William, which then also get disseminated in other school networks of schools and colleges in India. In the in the third chapter, in the next chapter of the book, you talk about how that that particular construction of Muslimness becomes in like part and parcel of what it means to generate Urdu prose, if, mm-hmm. if I've read mm-hmm. you accurately there. So could you tell us a little bit about how the uh, how what's being produced at Fort William College, initially for uh, British officers, uh, gets seeps into the work of figures such as Nazir Ahmed and, and Hali? Okay, yeah. So, so this is where a bit of a rupture happens as well, and and I'll 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 uh, I'll start off with kind of re re uh, you know reestablishing uh, the, you know some around the eighteen thirties. Um, and so around the 1830s, Bago Bahar, texts like Bago Bahar are circulating uh, uh, similar texts uh, uh, or rival texts that have been produced um, um, by by writers such as Rajab Ali Sarur also seem to, you know, uh, 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 take take some center stage as well. And all of these are, uh, but, but really Bago Bahar in particular shows the Muslim very much in the image of the British Oriental tale. Uh, It imposes a certain kind of a national morality upon this subject. Uh, Muslims, as I said, even in Bagu Bahar are either uh, sultans uh, or or they are merchants. Um, And and, and so in a sense, there is these are these are very thinly veiled uh, ways uh, of 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 showing the, the Muslim subject in India. Uh, exactly how he is imagined uh, uh, by the 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 British uh, uh, colonial uh, 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 formation, um, and 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 so in a sense, these are the texts that begin circulating, and and so Muslims begin reading themselves as these licentious kings who are sitting around uh, with lots of women, drinking lots of wine, and and or you know, and and of course are being corrected for their bad behavior, um, and they're but they're also shown as seeing themselves as as these uh, superstitious. 
people who believe in 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 jinns and and in fairies so so this you know so this is and and these are the works they are told that you know these belong to you and these describe you as a people best um so 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 you know until 1857 all of this begins happening and of course 1857 is is a watershed moment for the for the british uh, uh colony in india uh uh in particular for the muslim community but of course also also for the political events that that follow at breakneck speed after that um but but for muslims 1857 is is critical not just because oh muslims were blamed for the for the conflict uh but also because muslims 1857 marks the formal end of muslim rule of of muslim kingship uh uh and and of muslim influence really in a serious way um on in 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 india uh, uh and and it's a moment of immense depression it's a moment uh in which the loss of cities like delhi and lucknow to british to the to to really to being run by british officers after the uh, the nawab culture uh uh summons uh, you know it's it's a moment of immense uh, of immense um you know of of grief really i want to say for uh for for muslim poets for muslim artists writers uh, uh in in um of that moment ghalib and mirza hadi ruswa are very prominent in all of this uh so but at the same time what this also marks is a new class of an a new and the rise of a new class of muslims who disengage themselves from the old culture who who disavow themselves from um you know from 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 you know the nawab culture from the mughal past of india and these people essentially become what we can call a new a new bourgeoisie uh, in india and 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 they are you know these people work for the british they are part of the establishment they go to british schools um if they don't go to british schools they try to become like the the you know become exactly good subjects in a sense mm. um and and these people now become a uh, a uh, uh, important to 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 the to a new urdu fiction that begins rising uh, from really the ashes of of the old um but but what's important here is and and i look at uh, two very important right three rather uh, one of uh, whom is uh, dipti nazir ahmed uh, probably you know known or, or called by many people as you know the first novelist in urdu you know whether or not he is is really not the question this book is asking but um uh, i look at altaf husain hali uh, who's known as the founder of the urdu nazam um and i look a little bit at at another writer uh, known as abdul halim uh, sharar who wrote these kind of historical urdu novels um for these people uh books like bago bahar uh, uh and and again the, you know they're told by their british masters that oh hello you muslims bago bahar is is the literature you have how can we expect anything from you um so in a sense these people produce a new set of works that are a reaction uh to uh, uh to this false literature that they have been told is theirs um um to some extent they also produce a a, a new set of uh, or a new rules new sets of rules for for the poetics in the, against very much against the uh the the form of the ghazal and I'll, I'll you know we can, we can elaborate on all of these in in a minute um but but let me say a little bit about dipti nazir ahmed uh, in particular uh, because he you know he he really sits down criticizes works like bago bahar criticizes the idea of fantasy uh, says in fact that yes um pre 1857 muslims were indeed dissipate they were indeed uh, uh, you know they they have forgotten true islam and this is where this new very urgent formation of of muslimness of the modern muslim subject begins to take take uh, you know t- begins to accelerate um they have forgotten true islam um dipti nazir ahmed in particular uh marks india and so does altaf husain uh hali they mark india as the site of muslim degradation they mark india as the site where muslims lost touch uh with a true islam um and so they, they so they accept the muslim chronotope in the oriental tale absolutely as a historical actor absolutely they accept india. it as a fact in as, fact okay. right they accept they say yes we are you know the muslims of india are in fact these dissipate useless uh, kings or nawabs uh, and their mercantile mercantile activities are are wrong as well hmm. so so they really take they, they they begin to produce a new set of works against 
the British uh, or the British chronotope that has mm. been the Mohammedan chronotope, as opposed to examining their own historical presence uh, uh, in India or, or or the fact that Muslims. Uh, were, 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 you know, were very much are very much part of what was really a cosmopolitan society. That courts were centers of mixture, not of of divide. Um, you know, so so they they begin to create this a new identity that is now based on a certain idea of Muslimness, um, but also very much an idea that Muslims are not native to India, mm-hmm. and and in that they cement begin to cement all of these Orientalist ideals um, in a in a through Islam itself, through a through a kind of a new religious ideology, rather than um, through through you know rather than 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 through discussion or or through historical uh, 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 you know historical debate. Um, and Nazir Ahmed's books, you know, and in, in, in he's known for uh, for a, 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 a little women's manual known as Miratul Arus. He's also known for um, a book of conversion where a, a kind of a man who is very casual about his Muslimness uh, converts to becoming a real born again Muslim. It's called Tabat and Nasu. Um, and uh, and there's uh, several other works. He also wrote books for children. Um but uh, uh, Miratul Arus and, and Tabat and Nisu are in particular, they're very important because they do two things. Uh, in Miratul Arus, uh, what you can see is is the formation of a new uh, Sunni identity. Um, it is a book that speaks up against uh, many practices that are uh, uh, that you know that that are native to India. Uh, that that you know where where you can see that Islam itself has has flourished and has has taken has there is a way of being. Muslim that is part of this geography of the geography that we occupy uh, today, but but that is that has to be done away with in Nazir Ahmed's books, and and what begins is a is a kind of a search for a for an older, better, golden Islam that's encapsulated in some distant reality that's not in India in particular. Um, uh, Al Tafus and Hali begins doing the same thing. In particular, I, I mean, I look at one of his 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 long poems, uh, Madhu Jazar, uh, Madhu Jazar Islam, um, which studies again the decline of Muslims who you know in as they come to India. And he talks about there's one terribly memorable line in it where he talks about the the I think the Kashti Hijaz or the Kashti that you know the, the boat that comes from Hijaz or or Arabia. Um, sinking in the dirty waters of the Ganga, uh, mm. of the of the Ganges River in in India, and and in, and that really you know really puts together the the message that these new reformists, these Muslim reformist writers, um, wanted to 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 give in this fiction that India has become the site of a new Muslim uh, decline, and and uh, and you know the 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 job of these writers as they see themselves is to reassimilate. Uh, Muslims or people who call themselves who who practiced Islam in India into a new nation that is separate from all others in um, mm. in India and and so you know so these these two are very important and of course Abdul Halim Sharar is this other historical writer who you know who's a bit of a uh, I want to say a, a bit of a bad boy in the sense that his he has these historical romance novels. Uh, they have you know these random details that are quite you know strange. Uh, but uh, you know, but but what's interesting about his works also is that he rewrites a Muslim history that is again whose whose great moments are outside of India. Mm. Um, you know, so so, uh, uh, so Muslim Spain uh, sites mm. like those. Yeah. So India is a site of decline. Yeah. But through th- their prose works also sort of um, inject hope into what a reformed Muslim subject might exactly. look like as well. Exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, in the next chapter, where you where you take the story forward, uh, could you could you tell our tell, tell our readers how the generation after Dipti Nazir Ahmed mm-hmm. or Hali, for whom um, the reformed Muslim, as as you put it, is is a bourgeois subject. What does the reform Muslim look like in the Urdu prose that follows? Mm-hmm. And in this chapter, you also mentioned that the story that's written of the development of Urdu prose leaves out important figures who are who are building on and carrying the legacies of someone like uh, Dipti Nazir Ahmed. So could you tell us what the standard story is or what mm-hmm. happens after Nazir Ahmed's generation? And then the intervention you make there of what 
what's missing from that story mm. yeah so so this is actually this is a this is central this chapter is um central to the argument of 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 the book but it it also this is a chapter that really i i understood and conceptualized only after spending you know some 7 8 years in in pakistan um after returning from graduate school and an extended time away from from the country uh um so the way that you know the history of urdu is written is that yes uh, deputy nazir ahmed altaf hussain hali sharar all these people were reformists they created this new category of realist or seemingly realist urdu fiction um and but you know they were they were kind of didactic they really focused on morality and actually urdu literature is a very secular category because guess what around the 1920s 30s um the progressive movement the all india progressive movement takes off and there are you know figures like Saadat Hasan Manto Ismail Chukhtai Faiz Ahmed Faiz begin to dominate the landscape um and urdu literature is really it has nothing to do with islam it has nothing to do with muslimness and and you know it's produced works of great modernism um and uh you know and and that it is it is a language for all of india this is the story um that is told about about urdu particularly urdu of the 1930s and 40s 50s even the 60s um and uh and and what this story follows is really a very um you know a, a western nationalist uh, way of of thinking about the category of literature that in a sense it's developing into uh you know into a category that serves more and more people um but also that it's a category that's seemingly secular um and and you know but the argument i make in this book is that that figures like manto really are marginal mm. to the uh to the muslim imagination of of pakistan today um and were marginal even in the moment that they were writing and i actually look at uh two two very larger than life urdu uh, novelists um one of whose name is naseem hijazi um and the other is a woman really grandmotherly type woman by the name of of razia bat um naseem hijazi is 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 really um naseem hijazi writes in the 19 40s he's part of the pakistan movement um and uh, uh he writes these again historical novels but but that really evoke a, a very serious uh, nationalism or nationalist impulse in in muslims uh, uh who are reading these works and in his most famous work that i look at very closely in in the book is is a novel by the name of muhammad bin qasim um that you know revisits the the conquering of india uh, by uh, a young man by called muhammad bin qasim somewhere in around 700 or so Uh, maybe 800 i can look up the dates again um ad it talks about how islam comes and saves all of of sindh province from the terrible hindu rulers who rule um in a sense hijazi offers us uh, you know this new kind of history of india in which hindus are essentially evil and muslims have come to uh, save uh, all of sindh that is oppressed by um you know all of of sindh province that is being oppressed by um its hindu rulers um and and again there's there's you know th- and this is an this book comes out right around 1944 um it it you know it's it's the the, the timing couldn't be better because we're leading up to partition leading up to a moment in which it becomes clear that um you know muslims have nothing to do with india their only job there was salvation um and and again you know it, it makes the argument of course for that that muslims are separate they are d- a distinct people because in hijazi's works you either convert to islam or your you know you you are evil or you die um and and so good people who didn't convert end up dying and and that's where they go but the rest many characters convert because islam is is so powerful um this is this is one writer hijazi's books by the way uh the numbers are stunning um so he's producing around each each run of one of his novels was around 1000 novels a run he he goes into repeat editions within a year of each run so so the man is sold out he is he is a best seller in no uncertain terms um likewise so is razia bat who is this young woman who begins writing she she's a little bit later than 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 hijazi but her stories are similar and and she is memorialized uh uh in an even greater fashion than than hijazi because her works continue till today 
uh, to offer uh, 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 storylines and plots for the television television dramas in Pakistan. Um, and you know, one of her more more popular works is a is a novel by the name of Bano that was recently, very recently, I think a decade ago, uh, televised as as dust as as. Uh, Das, Dastan, yeah, that was the name of the drama. It's a partition drama about once again, um, you know, how Muslims really have no place in India and those who attempt to stay or those who attempted to stay during 1947 met with terrible ends. Um, so, so the argument I really make here is that it's works like Hijazi's and Razia Bhatt who are really the the inheritors, the science of of. Um, the legacy of of Nazir Ahmed and uh, 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 and 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 Altaf Hussain Hali that these are the people who take the question of Muslim identity into a properly national history, right? And and they really shape uh, a Muslim identity in 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 you know according to 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 a couple of points. One, Muslims belong to Makkah essentially; that is their homeland, um, or 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 their homeland or their way of being is outside of India, um. And two, that India itself is only uh, uh, is is antagonistic to the Muslim identity. That there is there is no way Muslims can be in India. So in a sense, they really um, you know partition is is not only you know um, because a couple of these works are pre partition, a couple are post partition. Partition is reinforced both prior to the event and after the event in these novels, um, and and you know and the idea that you can be an Indian Muslim, that there is an Islam that can flourish in India. There is an Islam that has taken shape over many centuries in India is is completely antithetical uh, mm. uh, uh, to these uh, uh, to the, to the ideologies that these two writers uh, propagate. But the, but the real thing is really the real point that this uh, that this chapter and the departure that this chapter takes from conventional histories of Urdu is precisely this that. You know, these this is this is the historical continuity that the nineteenth century uh, 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 that this is the historical continuity of the nineteenth century. It is not the progressives and 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 as I said, the progressives remain in every fashion marginal uh, 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 to um, um, to to the influence, and we see it today in 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 our own moment in our own present moment in in the in the in the popular imagination we see evidence of of that today moving on to the last sort of substantive chapter of the book uh the a running theme has been the reworking of the muslim figure either as a reaction to or a replication of or some combination of the two of, of the muhammadan chronotope in the oriental tale so in the last chapter you which is titled populist piety um how how does how does the project of uh someone like uh Naseem Hijazi or someone like Razia Bhatt get taken up in other words it, uh how is urdu and muslimness sort of brought together in in contemporary urdu novels okay yeah uh, uh so so let me uh, let me actually go back a second and maybe uh, just think very briefly about partha chatterjee the 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 great uh, bengali uh, uh, uh you know kind of theorist really and historian um and and one of the, some of the categories that chatterjee uh, talks about in one of his very famous works uh, the name is escaping me right now but um, he talks about how a nation has a moment of, or or the or a national body, a nation in the making, has a moment of departure, a moment of arrival, and and the moment of arrival in his uh, encapsulation is Nehruvian India, or you know, and probably we can argue the Hijazi, Hijaz, Pakistan of Asim Hijazi and Razia, but he doesn't, and at least in the in that particular uh, work, he doesn't go beyond that. Um, but this is where this is this is actually the final chapter is about our present moment and what it really looks at is the afterlife of the nationalism of the 1940s of the uh, the afterlife of the decolonial moment and 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 i argue that the afterlife is populism the argue that afterlife is a nascent fascism that we see emerging but in particular the the works i look at actually think about this um this populism in entirely uh, uh muslim terms um and so i i look at a group of writers a post 11 group of women writers in particular uh, farat uh, ishtiaq uh, omera ahmed and another writer 
writer by the name of um, uh, Nimra Ahmed. And I look at these novels that these writers produce. Uh, and, and what I argue is that these writers have now, they, they disavow even the idea of the nation. And what they argue is for an entirely new uh, a reinvention of Muslim identity that disavows from the nation if the nation is failing to follow Islam or the nation is failing to prescribe Islam um, in the ways that these writers believe Islam should be imagined. Instead, what these writers summon is a return to a golden past to and and again a past that is not accessible a past that is is solely um imagined um and and so uh, uh so they imagine and and they in fact they summon this this uh, return to uh, uh to to this to this imagined past which is the the makkah of the prophet muhammad uh they reimagine this in very particular terms um they uh, you know there is a there is a uh, and and they really they begin to condemn uh so you know many practices of Islam that take place in contemporary Pakistan. They condemn Westernization. They condemn women who leave the home to work. Um, they ask and they ask for a certain subservience of of the wife. But if the husband is not convert enough, they ask the woman to. Uh, you know, in in some sense, the woman is wedded to Allah, if 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 nothing else, and and that really is the new Muslim identity that they produce. Um, um, you know, the the problem with these writers is that they're outstandingly popular, and 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 really, they 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 see and 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 many of them understand their own popu popularity, and they're able to talk about themselves as leading the nation. Uh, Omera Ahmed, in particular, has spoken of herself as leading the nation. Um, has 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 spoken of. Um, you know, of of uh, uh, you know, of literary writers or or actual Urdu adibs, people who write high literature as irrelevant, has spoken of herself as leading the nation into a new moment into the twenty first century, um, and and you know, so so I look at uh, novels such as Ham Safar, also made into a blockbuster drama, uh, Shehrazad, which is a short story by Omera Ahmed about a young woman who, you know, finds Allah while her husband is too busy cheating on her. Um, and it ends up staying with the husband because she figures that's what Allah would would probably have you know uh, prescribed. Uh, and then I also look at a, 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 a you know a, a writer, but I also look at some of some of the other novels that these people have written, particularly novels like Pire Kamil, Abe Hayat, which you know which focus on uh, immense hatred for particular minorities of Pakistan, um, anti-Christian, um, and and you know which 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 condone a certain kind of violence. Um, and and again, so so I look at the 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 invention of of really uh, a global. I suppose a global anti-national Muslim, um, who Muslim identity that in the case that Pakistani Islam fails, they must reinvent the idea of Muslimness itself, um, and return once again to to Makkah or return there. And and so in a sense, what I argue is that yes, the Oriental tale takes a full circle uh, in in the twenty first century, with the creation of these populist this populist Muslim imaginary, and where the Muslim is is homeless in the once again. As yeah. as imagined, yeah, uh, in the Oriental. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what what does what does the future hold? What mm -hmm. what projects are you looking towards working on? Okay. So <laughs> right now, I uh, I have a two and a half year old and a two almost three month old. Uh, I have two kids now, um, and let me say this: women's gray matter. Uh, dying after children is real, uh, but I am I am looking uh, beginning my next project very slowly. It's probably it's a toss up uh, between uh, and maybe even together looking at the works of of the of the twentieth uh, century Urdu poet Femi Daryaz, uh, also a mother of of children, um, but also a feminist. Uh, a great poet and a political worker. Um, and at the same time, I also want to revisit uh, very closely, uh, this this work is very close to my heart, the works of Muhammad Hadi Ruswa, the uh, the poet and novelist. Uh, in particular, I I want to spend some time on his novel, Umrao Janada, as, as, as a book that really thinks about what a pre, uh, a pre colonial or pre modern uh, cosmopolitan Muslim identity, especially for women, uh, could look like. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today, Maria. Thanks, Fezi.